Good afternoon, everybody. We've got uh, people trickling into our webinar here, and but I, I will uh, kick things off this afternoon. My name's Emma Dawson. I'm Executive Director at Per Capita, and I'm coming to you today from the lands of the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and thank them for their many centuries of custodianship of the lands and waters on which my family now lives, land which was never ceded. Uh, welcome to this per capita webinar, uh, one, of, one of our terrific conversations with people that are writing about our current state of play in politics and public policy. And I'm thrilled today to be joined by Joe Dyer, who has written this fabulous essay for the In the National Interest series, Monash Publishing, Burning Down the House, Reconstructing Modern Politics. It's an incredibly invigorating and enraging read. Joe, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here for your webinar. Thank you. A um, bit of housekeeping to start with, folks. If you do have a question for Joe, we'll be taking uh, having a QA and a towards the end of this hour together. Please place your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to use the chat function to talk to each other if you have comments to make, but the Q&A box is where I will find your questions, and I'll do my best to get to as many of them as I can uh, when we get to that point in about half an hour or so. Um, but Joe, this essay, um, one of the quickest reads for me, not, not because it's shorter than any of the others in the season, but because I was going, yes, 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 and reading along with it and um, finding it very difficult to put down. So it, it is a one session read. I'd like to open our chat by reading a quote that really stood out for me from your essay, um, and then ask you to comment on it and, and what you, uh, how you how you got inspired to write it. Um, but this is the quote I've, I'm gonna start with. Jo says in her essay, we have stopped, Australia has stopped, being a serious nation, a sober global citizen who works with other nations for the betterment of the world, mindful of others, the planet, the future. We are instead a shallow, venal, self-serving country that cannot be trusted to keep its word and that takes the worst kind of domestic politics to the international stage. And that resonated with me a lot. I think that's how I feel our country has descended over the last couple of years in particular. What brought you to that conclusion? Look, I think it came out of the discussions um, that took place really between the two coalition parties in the lead up to COP26 in Glasgow. I think we have been on this sort of slow, sad trajectory downward, particularly around climate policy, which is one of the key areas where global cooperation is so vital in our contemporary times. And we have just been, you know, not just and a laggard, but an outlier. I think that was the phrase that Guterres used last week. Um, and it's it's not just embarrassing and sort of humiliating, but it really does mean that Australia is no longer, you know, a moral player um, in international affairs. So we had all of that kind of ridiculous charade where all of Australia had to stand waiting while the few members of the National Party caucus decided what our climate policy was going to be, you know, Morrison kind of eavesdropping from outside, hoping that things went his way so that he could use the sentence um, net zero by 2050, because that's essentially all it is, just being given permission to use that sentence. So we had all of that playing out. Um, and then, of course, that coincided with the just terrible betrayal of the trust of our French allies. Now, you can say what you like about AUKUS itself, and, and I think there are kind of potential problems with it, but separate to the substance of it was, again, the way it was handled or mishandled by the government, and then the dishonesty that was brought to bear, and the idea that you just basically lie to your allies and then when you get caught out you try and play ridiculous games um, about you know the timing of text messages and you know just Morrison playing the same games that he plays domestically but when dealing with our international um, allies and leaders and friends you know that's it's just not the way that as I say mature countries behave um, and you know, one of the things that 
has always struck me actually uh, more generally, but particularly in the last few years, is that whenever something egregious happens or terrible happens or something with which Australia, Australians disagree, they always go, oh, but this is not who we are. Come on, this is un-Australian. But there has to be a point that we accept that this is in fact exactly who we are and that because we are electing this type of leader, this is Australian and this is what we are projecting onto the world stage and to each other. Um, and surely there is a point at which, and I think that point is coming, where the Australian public say enough is enough and they actually demonstrate that this is not who we want to be. I hope, I sincerely hope you're right, but the essay, of course, opens I mean, with a just a litany of failures by this government over the last couple of years. You talk about the, the failure to respond um, in, with any sort of leadership to the bushfire crisis. Um, you talk about the failure to respond as mates would to uh, the, the interpreters that worked for us in Afghanistan and the leaving of those people behind, uh, the failure to treat unemployed people with any dignity and to try and us and them into a deserving and undeserving poor, um, all issues that, um, you know, we, my, my Myself and my colleagues at and most of our audience, I think, would um, would find equally distressing. Um, and then you come, of course, to Morrison's attitude towards women um, and to the your own experience there as a, fr a friend of, of, of Kate, um, the victim, alleged victim of the uh, Attorney General in her teens, and your deep feeling and finding from talking to other people that Morrison is deeply chauvinistic and that he can't understand or empathise or relate to women, that he prefers not to work with women, and how that persona influences all of his other failures. Can you talk a bit about that chauvinism? Because I think it is, show, I think chauvinism is the right word. It's not necessarily misogyny or, or blatant sexism. There's a deep chauvinistic streak in the man. Well, and I think part of that, I mean, there was an interesting article that I was just reading, article I was just reading this morning about, um, you know, why is it that so many of the critics um, uh, of Morrison at the moment who are coming out and kind of calling out his behaviour are women, um, and that's within his own party. And the interesting thing is, is that he just doesn't have women in his inner circle. So all of the key positions um, within his office, uh, his allies, his factional supporters, they're all men. And that's the point that Annika Smethurst makes in her book as well, The Accidental Prime Minister, is that that's where he feels comfortable. He doesn't feel comfortable with strong women around him and certainly doesn't want strong women telling him what to do. So there is this sort of... Uh, casual disregard um, for women's voices um, and not having voices around a table and speaking truth to you absolutely impacts on the perspective that you have. And this kind of, oh, shucks, you know, we men are just doing what we can, you know, as if that's somehow good enough in the 21st century. Um, but the pernicious fact of it is firstly the way that then all of the issues that came up with such a vengeance last year and very specific issues around workplace safety, around harassment, around assault and abuse and how best to handle that. I mean, he simply had no idea and you saw him kind of wandering hopelessly through that, that kind of contemporary media scape, not knowing how to even engage on a public level, let alone on a private level. And, you know, the most obvious point of that was he genuinely didn't know what to do about um, and how to handle uh, the Brittany Higgins allegations until he spoke to Jenny. And Brittany said that herself um, the best when she said, I wasn't looking for his sympathy as a father. I was looking for leadership as a prime minister. Um, and, you know, to, to basically take that case, Brittany Higgins's case, as he did kind of Kate's case, and the first instinct is always just to... Um, stonewall to try and hide the problem dodge the problem keep the problem down the road uh, until hopefully the media interest has waned and you can move on um, and obviously for women that was just not going to be good enough uh, in that instance and there it did seem to be and does seem to be and I hope that we can maintain that energy this sort of a, a cultural shift that was taking place. The whole atmosphere was very febrile in terms of the contemporary political debate. And women were really saying, 
no, no, things really do have to change this time. But of course, what we need to do is, is to not just harness that energy around how individual cases of sexual assault or harassment in the workplace and, and, and change the policies very specifically around that there, but also look at how the policies more broadly of the Morrison government and indeed any government are impacting on women, um, women's economic security, as well as physical security. And none of these things feature at all on Morrison's uh, agenda. And you can see that from that ridiculous task force that was set up where it was pretty much every single woman who was in cabinet, who was on the front bench, chuck them on this panel, have Morrison sitting there look, talking to them and in fact dominating uh, most of the speaking time anyway, and then problem solved yeah. uh, according to him. Um, and you know, you and your work would know better than I um, the way that you know, it's not just the tradey fest, but it's really all of their economic policies just are designed to support a very traditional idea of what an Australian household is um, and not deal with any of the, um, you know, the fault lines that was thrown up into such stark relief over the course of the pandemic. So that the chauvinism really manifests itself in just this blindness, um, which, you know, you initially might say is, you know, just circumstantial that's what men of his generation and makeup are like but as people keep trying to tell him it does sort of fall over into something more willful I think and about the kind of country that he wants to have and he feels comfortable inhabiting. I agree completely and you'll be unsurprised to hear that I think that the most staggering thing for me in the budget well there was plenty staggering in the budget not much of any substance but their attempt to portray the changes to paid parental leave as a as a positive thing so yeah. another, this, is, this is more choice it's more leave for the family it's not we had 18 weeks for the primary parent and two weeks for the father which is how it usually is in a heterosexual relationship now you've got 20 weeks for anyone who wants to use it now we know all the evidence shows that that will discourage men from taking leave that what we actually needed was the opposite of that which is a more a, a higher use it or lose it proportion of leave for men um but that I think speaks to what you just said which is that there's a deliberate I think it's deliberate I don't think it's accidental but there is a deliberate attempt to keep women in that traditional um, home-based role and that Morrison feels I think quite strongly about that um so yeah their, their ability or attempts to sell that paid parental leave as a good thing for women, I think, has fallen pretty flat. Um, well, you reflect, I think, sort of what you do in the first half of the essay, and I will definitely be coming to the, the piece on, on labour um, shortly, so don't anyone in our audience think that we're going to be dodging that. Um, but you build, I think, a, a, a picture that, for me, on reflecting on it, takes all of the things that Morrison purports to be, you know, a, a good bloke, a mate, a leader, someone that can be relied on not to make too many people uncomfortable and show through his response to various crises that he's the opposite of those things. He has not displayed mateship to the people we've left behind in Afghanistan, for example. Yeah, look, absolutely. I mean, it was... Well, we all have just gone through, you know, the last two and a half years together, really, with the pandemic. So the essay tries to really just use that as this, a structure, um, as you say, starting with the Black Summer bushfires and moving through to the time when I had to submit it, which was December, which, of course, means there's any number of other examples um, that have taken place since then, because they don't seem to abate in any way while we're suffering under this government. Um, but at, at every point, you know, it did seem that there were... Uh, not just sort of mistakes, but really um, demonstrations of a, a lack of moral fibre and calibre. And I think that the treatment of the people who had helped us in Afghanistan is just mm. such a stark one. I mean, you, here we are people who, you know, were there beside us in the theatre of war, without whom we could not have done what we did. Um, and they have strong support from the Australian soldiers um, who were there and who relied on them. And first of all, and th this I believe is because anything to do with bringing in people and particularly brown people mm -hmm. through our immigration system, um, the reflexive response of home affairs and, and under Dutton and, you know, following in the fine lead set originally by Morrison is just to keep people out. That's really what they want to do. 
first and foremost is to not let people come in, particularly from that part of the world. Um, so when these interpreters who had worked with us were starting to say, look, hey, you know, we're in um, really serious danger here. And this is dating back years. Um, so before that crisis of, um, developed around when the Americans were going to withdraw before the ultimate fall of Kabul. Um, yes, there was a program that was set up, um, but it was then like mired in bureaucratic processes that played no regard to actually the reality on the ground and what is actually logistically possible for people to procure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the number of copies, colour photocopiers, in, um, you know, translated and certified, all of these different things that make it incredibly difficult to do anyway. But then worse was that there was this sort of legalistic interpretation of what it actually was to be employed by Australia. So if you were employed by an NGO, for example, um, but were doing the work with uh, the Australian Armed Forces, then you were rejected. I mean, it, it was as simple as that. It was a very black letter legalistic um, process, which mirrors all of the black letter legalistic processes that our department has been doing for all refugees, um, which you know, I would argue is outrageous and appalling and immoral anyway, but particularly in this instance, and particularly given that you know, the coalition governments in particular just love um, having the military behind them, using them as props in every which way possible. And yet the gap between the kind of the, the decoration and the kind of the costumed props that the military become and that the way that they deal with them when the military is actually and, and the members of the military are actually in need or asking for something. And so, yes, these people were saying, bring our mates here and they just didn't. And then, of course, when it became a crisis and they realised that the, the popular opinion was turning against them, it was too late. Um, but the way that they handle the military more generally, I mean, you can see, um, you know, Jackie's Lamb Lambie's advocacy of what's going on in the Department of Veteran Affairs and the backlog of people who, who need support from them, um, how long it took them to, to call a Royal Commission into the really just outrageous rates of suicide amongst our return forces. It's like there's no follow through on anything. There's no attempt to really engage with the substance of things if they think that they can superficially address them for a media cycle. Um, and it, it's no way to govern a country, that's for sure. No. Um, I think one of the things that struck me about that passage too was, you know, as you just made the point, if, if, if those interpreters were regarded as contractors rather than direct employees, they're not our responsibility anymore. That's um, exactly right. And yeah. they've taken that approach to the whole economy, right? So um, if you're not an employee but you're a gig worker, you, our, our industrial relations system doesn't apply to you. If you're not employed at all, uh, we're not even going to help you directly. We're going to outsource you to private job active service providers so that the ability the attempt to be not responsible for anything but to benefit somehow from the optics is I think pretty clearly the ideology of the government across the board yeah look it is um I mean it, this this sort of craziness of like the, the war on public the public service for example so you know hollowing that out um reducing the numbers and again like it's interesting the different value which is placed on different jobs in this country too so that you can cut a swathe through um public service and lose tens of thousands of jobs in Canberra and that's not only not a problem, it's something to be celebrated, but losing a potential couple of hundred somewhere in a mining community to make the, to start a process of transitioning to a renewable economy, which is going to save all of us. No, though each of those jobs is the most incredibly valuable job in the world. And for someone who comes from an arts background, you know, watching what happened to the arts community and the number of jobs that were lost there over the last two to three years, someone, you know, and for a lot of the arts workers, it was, um, they lost all of their arts work. Their backup jobs are normally teaching. And then what was done to, to academia as well, that was not just left out, but things were deliberately manipulated to exclude them. So they lost their teaching jobs as well. And so then they um, had to fall back on their hospitality work and that too was gone. And yet again, no consideration given um, to any of this. Um, so it really is, uh, you know, 
the hollowing out of it all, which doesn't actually save money because then they just have to contract everything in um, through their favourite donor kind of big four um, consulting companies. I mean, it's just this self-perpetuating cycle um, which benefits ideological allies of the government, but at the expense of the rest of us. Um, and it just... Yeah. It's just not the way that we, I think we want to, to run our country. No, there's a very us and them mentality in, from mm -hmm. this government. And, and you also talk here about the, the class of the undeserving poor, you know, um, and I think that's been one of the stark, I'm, I'm doing a chapter on, on this government for a book on this government's attitude to social security and welfare. And I think more than any other area, they have deliberately fostered that idea that there are people that deserve support and people that don't deserve support. You have a go, you get a go, right? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of things that you can say about that. I mean, the first is, and this is sort of, it's interesting um, the way that our you know, government systems have been set up and actually talking to quite a few people on the campaign trail, um, and this is across aged care, it's across, across the NDIS uh, and it's across the social security system. So there's the issue around how much money people get and we can kind of come to that in a minute, but there's actually also the issue around how the systems have been deliberately constructed. Um, and the complexity, the kind of the Kafkaesque labyrinthine world that people have to enter, um, often at very vulnerable times in their lives or often because they are vulnerable themselves, whether it's through, you know, ongoing disability or um, that they're unwell or chronic ill health or something like that. So they're vulnerable and then they're being confronting this kind of wall of bureaucracy and actually hostile bureaucracy and actually often hybridized private public bureaucracy. As you say, um, we have privatized or semi-privatized so many of our important um, services. So even if the, it's, so say so with the social security system, obviously that's being funded fully by government, but it's private providers who are engaging with the people on the front line. And they are given enormous power, private entities who are not just converting public money to private profit, because in the end, that's why all these people are working in this space to make money. So that is just wasted money, I'd argue. But they're also given incredible powers over people's lives. Um, and in the case of the social security system, with all of the really Byzantine kind of mutual obligations, which do seem very, very arbitrary and are designed to just sort of make these people jump through hoops. There's no tangible benefit coming out from some of the training, for example. It's literally that you have to just turn up and be there. But if you're not, if you can't comply for whatever reason, um, and sometimes it's not your fault, you get communication sent to you which went to an old address or whatever and you get cut off um so the most vulnerable people very poor looking to try and just keep themselves fed and housed are in an environment where suddenly they've got no income for six weeks and that's been determined by a middle manager sitting at a desk yes. pushing papers around so all of that is just Punitive, arbitrary and unacceptable, I would argue, in the way that the systems are set up. But then, of course, you have at the end of the system, so particularly around social security, for example, just the paucity of what is on offered. And I think that the, the interesting contrast in all of that was indeed, as you allude to, what happened during the pandemic and that moment where, and, and Frydenberg talks about it as being the most confronting day of his pandemic, was when overnight a lot of the um, hospitality and tourism and performing arts and other outlets just had to close down. And so there were people lining up around the centre, around the block to, to get into Centrelink. Mm. And that was when he was like, oh, no, well, we can't have that. Mm. Um, those people, they're not like real unemployed. Right. They're just unemployed, situ you know, situationally. Yeah. yeah. So overnight. They might have a mortgage, Joe. They might have a mortgage. They might have a mortgage. What about <laughs> 
you be on the streets? So overnight we doubled Job Seeker and overnight um, all of those people who had been not just sort of struggling but really desperate, in desperate circumstances, that terrible anxiety, that kind of gnawing uncertainty was alleviated immediately. Um, and, you know, it was interesting and Andrew Charlton, who has been in the press for different reasons over the last few weeks, but uh, he did, he conducted a, you know, a fantastic um, study and some research on this very issue, because it's not often that you can have real time examples like this one, where sure. you can actually observe the differences yeah. um, between, you know, one day to the next. And, you know, they tracked with permission all of the different expenditure patterns of the people who had been on unemployment benefits before uh, the coronavirus supplement was set in um, to see what they did. And, you know, surprise, surprise, it was all spent very sensibly, um, you know, providing for their kids, um, paying down debt. And what it also showed that it didn't act as a disincentive for people to, to still actively look for work. So all of this cruelty is the point so that you incentivize job searching. And that's why we have to make people live in really dire circumstances you know the again the evidence and this is what's ignored in so many different policy areas by this government and indeed labor in policy development process the evidence is ignored and the ideology which confirms their bias is the thing that they will follow blindly right. and it's it's nowhere more evident I think than in the approach to welfare um, yeah. and to the support of the people that need support the most um, one of the you know, the, the key things I think for me is that issue of the loss of the parliamentary accountability. And this is another theme throughout this government, but many people don't realize it was only three years ago that this government changed the laws around welfare and, and income support so that those decisions to suspend payments could be made in a job active office and they weren't appellable back to the parliament. And that, that level of abandoning accountability for the welfare of the people is just profoundly undemocratic in my view. Look, it absolutely is. And I think it's, I mean, the lack of accountability of this government kind of across every area is is extraordinary. And the fact that they have been allowed to get away with it to such a degree is also deeply disappointing. And, and some of that is obviously to do with the concentration of our media in this country as well. But I think part of that, you know, or the lack of integrity and accountability and accountability in our politics is part of the reason why you are seeing so many different um, people step forward and say, you know what, we're not, we're not going to accept this anymore. And, and if we have to, we'll run ourselves. Um, and that's, I think, the rise of the independence, and you know, we can probably talk about that a little bit later, but it is I th is a response to the lack of accountability um, and the frustration that there really don't seem to be other mechanisms by which the government of the day can be held to account at the moment. And that is particularly galling when the behaviours are so egregious. And I think we've seen that in different ways. So both the I think you can call it corrupt behaviour um, of individuals within our parliament who have just have just got away with um, bad behaviour, criminal behaviour potentially without any consequences or if there have been consequences, there's been like sit in the naughty corner for a few weeks on the back bench um, and then you'll be welcomed back. And, you know, whether it's Susan Lay or it's Stuart Robert or it's Bridget McKenzie, it's Barnaby Joyce, you know, they do their time, but then they're straight back onto the front bench. But then others who have arguably behaved in ways that are either worse or we don't know, they appear worse, but we don't know because there's been no proper inquiries. And that, among, you know, Angus Taylor is mm. a clear example there, like all sorts of nefarious ac activities seems to have gone on by him, but we don't know because they just, this government won't hold people to account and won't demand that they take responsibility for their actions. So there's the personal behaviours, but then and I think uh, in more far reaching ways, there is the policy development failures and the way that policy has been skewed and in some cases even written um, by people who have very particular corporate sectional financial interests um, rather than being considered for 
you know, what is best for our nation. And when there seems to be absolutely no way to disrupt that, like whatever is said, whatever is done, whatever evidence is presented, things seem to continue on as normal and the status quo uh, ticks over again. I think that's where people are throwing up their, um, their hands in despair and that's where they are saying, okay, well, we're actually going to have to grapple very directly with our democratic processes. Yeah. Well, let's, I mean, let's get to that now. I think the, the, the people standing up uh, and saying enough, there is, this is a government governing for sectional interests. It's not governing for all of us. Um, and they're overwhelmingly women. Um, and before I come to the independence movement, which is overwhelmingly women movement, if you can call it that, um, the women in their own, in Morrison's own party have been the first to, to stand up and call this out. Brittany Higgins being the most obvious as a staffer, uh, Julia Banks, of course, very famously, and I think very bravely standing against the kind of culture of silence of women within her party. Um, and now Catherine Cusack, the New South Wales um, upper house MP that's quit the party over Morrison's very obvious and deliberate we will provide um, flood relief for this electorate because they vote for us but not for this electorate because they don't and she called that out in extremely strong terms yesterday in the Guardian why is it women that are standing up like this do you think and saying no well, look, I think um, there's a couple of reasons for that. But I think the first one, and particularly in relation to the Liberal Party women, of course, is that they're finding that they're being squeezed out of their own party. Um, they, you know, if... Well, Maurice Payne continued to maintain, as late as in an interview with Annabelle Crabb for her fabulous misrepresented um, last year, that whilst they could never agree to quotas um, because that's an evil bad word that's now associated with the Labor Party. The Liberal Party did have a target of 50% gender parity in the federal parliament or in all parliaments um, by 2025. Now, if that was to be achieved at this election coming up, there would have to be 63 men currently in the Liberal Party party room leave and be replaced by women. Um, now, that isn't going to happen um, because not only are the Liberal Party not um, doing any better when it comes to the numbers of women taking seats in Parliament, they're actually going backwards. They, they're going backwards. Um, so in South Australia, just here at our recent election, there was only 23% of the candidates that were actually women. So if you're a, a woman and you have ambitions to get into parliament like the liberal party is not a place for you um and conversely for the labor party side of things is that actually the you know the factional system and the way that operates in uh within the labor party is itself a very alienating thing it's a it's a alienating, sometimes intimidating process. This is not just for women, this is for men and women. But if you don't want to throw yourself into that sort of institutional kind of thuggery, um, then, which is completely understandable, then the major parties are very difficult to try and access. Uh, and you can see that even in the way that it, even those women who do get involved. So, for example, now let's talk about the Labor Party side of things. Having had someone like Andrew Charlton be parachuted into Parramatta. Now, I happen to think Andrew Charlton is a great individual, fantastic mind, um, you know, will be an asset to any front bench. But to parachute him in from the eastern suburbs of Sydney, into where he's, you know, let's face it, a kind of wealthy, privileged white male into an area where you've got a lot of dynamic, young, diverse Labor Party members who've been working in that area, probably, you can imagine, aspiring to one day represent um, that seat and then just watch someone else be parachuted in over them. So, you know, the major party systems themselves um, the way that they pursue and wield party uh, wield power at an intra-party level does make it very difficult for people who are on the outer and will have a contribution that they want to make um, to engage and to really believe that that's a pathway um, to parliament for them. So it doesn't surprise me at all that there are 
you know, now people who are saying, well, I do think I have a contribution to make. I look at the job that you guys are doing at the moment and I think that that's, you know, somewhat, um, well, there are some deficits, shall we say. Um, so what can I do? And then the way that I think the independence movement has started to grow. Now, look, we don't know. We'll Obviously, we'll be able to assess the success or otherwise of it um, in a few short weeks' time. Um, but it does appear that there are alternative paths now that have been mapped out by others. Um, you know, Kathy McGowan is the one that we all sort of talk about because it was this attempt to really just revive a grassroots democratic engagement that initially wasn't even expected to lead to a seat in parliament, but then did. And you think, oh, hang on, maybe there is something happening here. And as more people started to engage with that idea, of course, like, you know, ideas and hope and enthusiasm and optimism are all contagious. So it was like every week towards the end of last year when a new candidate was announced that was greeted by this sort of wave of, of great enthusiasm and this sort of radical hope that things might be different, that that in itself, you know, the momentum sort of perpetuated itself along the way. So I think, you know, it does also is probably unsurprising that it's been our minor parties that have had um, more female leaders than the major parties for exactly the reasons that I was just espousing. I think it is interesting. I do want to come back to the the, the Labor issue because, you know, I've, I've dipped my toe into that Labor factional and run away running, well, screaming several times, um, because even if it's not a captain's pick like like um, Andrew's yes. position in Parramatta, it's still very much determined by, and they are almost all men who have power over the factions through the union system yes. through, um, and determine who's going to go into various seats and have their various trade-offs. The ALP quotas, the gender quota has been a very, very good thing, but then it's yes. sometimes results in horse trading between certain seats you know the right here in Victoria is notoriously bad at putting up female candidates for example so the left does a lot of the heavy lifting on on getting women into parliament um, but the gender thing is really interesting to me and in the in the Liberal Party and where some of those women that are standing as independents such as Allegra Spender in Wentworth and Kate Cheney over in WA are third fourth generation Liberal Party royalty right Cheney yes. and Spender are big names in the Liberal Party absolutely I see that very much actually as moderate lib coming from moderate liberal families and women that are trying to pull their party back from what they see as an extreme right-wing push um towards yeah. the center yeah no look absolutely and i think it it sort of gives the lie to this notion of the moderate liberals because you know the moderate liberals they they are not the ones who are influencing the policy direction of the liberal party so you know there's this sort of um I, generally speaking, you have the, you have these cries going up of well, why are the women, why are the teal independents that they're as they're called targeting the moderate liberals? It's going to be a, a lesser liberal party room if we don't have the types of the Dave Sharmas or the Trent Zimmermans who are attempting to moderate the Liberal Party's policy positions. But the fact is that they're failing. They're completely failing because what you know, the, the climate issue and the negotiations with um, the Nats in relation to COP26 is just like the starkest of all examples. Um, there are as many moderate liberals, moderate liberals, as there are National Party members, and yet that nowhere was the late Liberal Party feeling that they were being held to ransom by the moderate liberals on this really key policy area. So I think that those who do come from that you know, moderate part of the Labor Liberal Party are feeling completely squeezed out and they are throwing up their hands in despair and saying this is not the broad church, you know, how it's much wanted broad church that I joined originally or for whom I voted. Uh, and so when they are feeling that they have nowhere to go and they are completely disenfranchised, then, of course, they're going to now start their own maverick kind of um, political movement, which 
it seems to be the only way that the Liberal Party will take notice. You know, I do not think that we would have seen the number of refugees being released from detention uh, this in the last few weeks. Um, still a way to go, obviously, but in these last few weeks, were it not for the influence of the Teal independence, um, you know, I do not think that we would have seen the kind of confirmation of the ABC fundings as a, at the levels that we did if it wasn't. They are starting to try and make some small policy concessions um, to try and shore up the position of, of some of their key leadership. Um, you know, like the most interesting example in some ways is, um, I can't remember the name of her seat, but um, Natalie Bainey, who was running for pre-selection in New South Wales in for the Liberal Party, then got forced out because of inappropriate behaviours, she's alleged, from people, you know, like mm -hmm. ministers and then people within <laughs> Morrison's office again. Um, and now you've got now you've got women's council. Um, oh, I don't know if you've got I've got a little bit of feedback coming, but now they've got the in the women's council saying actually we we're not going to campaign against Natalie. We've worked with her for years within the Liberal Party, uh, and so now we've forced into this sort of terrible choice, and we're going to choose to stand back. So. Mm -hmm. The Liberal Party kind of organisationally really has, you know, big problems as a result of their failure to grapple with these big issues, which to date, anyway, does not seem to be making one iota of difference. And so you see just with the New South Wales contretemps in recent days that Morrison ludicrously on 7.30 last night attempted to say was him standing up for women <laughs> as he, you know, as he confirmed the pre-selections of two mates and, and one female um, and then listed off this sort of wonderful array of diverse candidates that had been supported through that New South Wales process, all of which bar one, um, in terms of the different um, cultural and ethnic backgrounds, are standing in unwinnable seats. Um, so it's just, again, this shows the sort of the shiftiness of the way that Morrison operates. And he says something which is just, there's a scintilla of truth amongst a miasma of lies, and that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> I love that phrase. I'm going to use it. No, <laughs> yeah. And of course, the, the seat you're talking about is Reed in New South Wales. Reed, Natalie yes, Bain. of course. Yep. It's a must-win seat, right? It's a must-win seat if they yeah. can hold on. And yet they treat it like this. So yeah. Um, look, I'm, I'm, we're waffling on far too much and could continue this all day, I'm sure. Um, there are a few questions, and one that I'm, will help us get to talking about Labor. You do you do talk about Labor in your essay, and you quote the great Labor Party elder statesman and policy hero Barry Jones in saying that he feels that Labor's lost the ability to prosecute an argument or to mount an argument, a policy argument. Is that one of the things that's led to, you obviously have a, a as Simon Cox says in our chat, you've, you're an outlier, you've got a, a background in the left rather than yeah. in the right as some of the other independents. Is that one of the big challenges you see and one of the problems that you have with the, with the Labor Party now? Well, look, yes, and this predates um, this particular uh, electoral cycle as well. I mean, my big concern, um, my huge policy concerns, I think, with Labor um, really came around the time of, uh, you know, Howard um, and Tampa um, and what that said about us as a country and what it said that we were prepared to do um, for political gain. So, you know, it's one thing for the Conservatives to behave in a way which is entirely self-serving and base and amoral, not even immoral, I think, but for um, the progressive parties to fall in behind them um, because they were too terrified of... Um, you know, of, of the political and electoral outcomes if they didn't, um, does be the question is, well, why can't you get out there and argue the alternative worldview? Like, what is it that you have lost um, that you cannot prosecute the case anymore? Because if you think back um, even to, to Keating, which is not that long ago, and the big policy debates that he took on, like you know, Native Title, for example, um, just took them up to um, the shock jocks uh, and the various interviewers that he was engaging with and to the Liberal Party itself. Um, just, no, we, this is not the way that we see Australia should go. We have a different idea for Australia. We're going to um, describe and create um, and seduce you with a different narrative of the type of country that we can be. 
Now, the Labor Party is really not doing that anymore. There are certainly policy positions which are better than the coalition and, you know, and I am hoping for a change of government. So, and I'm not, uh, you know, abashed or unafraid to say that in the way that some of my other independent colleagues are kind of hedging their bets a bit. Uh, it seems to me that if you're arguing on a platform of climate integrity and respect for women, you know, that's just a pretty sort of stark <laughs> voice in some ways. But Labor just really, and and I understand coming out of 2019, um, the nervousness around things, but what will it mean for us if they, if they win and then they have gone into an election um, arguing that they'll do a bit better on climate but not um, adopt scientific evidence-based policies of actually where what we need to be doing if we're going to avert the crisis i mean as of last week we're not really even talking about the ipcc is saying we can't even talk anymore about maintaining um, the increase in temperatures at 1.5 degrees we're already now looking at two degrees and you know the difference between those two temperature increases is enormous but that's where we are labor aren't grappling with this is where we want to be, let's work back. They're saying this is where we are and what we think we can get away with. But they're doing that on refugee policy. We're not even allowed to have conversations about a more humane and moral refugee policy at the moment, apparently. Um, that may cause, you know, them to be wedged again. So shh, let's just let them win um, and do nothing. Um, we can't have policy, we can't have discussions about really progressive taxation policy. Um, stage three tax cuts apparently have to be accepted because otherwise they might lose and they might get wedged on tax. So let's put that one to one side. Distortions in the housing market, um, you know, the source of the greatest intergenerational inequity after 2019 when they failed to make the case properly to um, grandfather out negative gearing. Now that's also off the policy agenda. So there's so many different areas where we're apparently now just not even able to have the conversation um, until after the election when we're safe, few. But what then? I mean, that's the question, what then? Because unless you really feel that you can you know, undercut your credibility and integrity with an electorate where you've said you're not going to do any of these things, um, you're not going to be able to do any of these things. And so what's the point of having a Labor government? I mean, I know it'll be better because, of course, it'll be better than this it one. Can't but be worse. It can't it, be worse. It's not really... Yeah. But I do, and I think when we look at the last time, and people go on about this a lot, well, the only time Labor's won convincingly from opposition in the last 30 years is Kevin Rudd, and he ran a small target agenda, you know, a Howard, a Howard Light. But having worked in that government, it did constrain then what you were able to do. There was a, a fear of being too big and too bold. And I think that fear goes back 25 years to the 1996 election. The party's still convinced that they lost that election because Keating had a vision for the country. And that's what Howard wanted them to believe. But, uh, you know, I think it was almost entirely economic reasons. Um, nothing, you know, very little to do with land rights and Mabo and engaging with Asia, um, much more to do with the recession we had to have. Um, well, look, we you know, absolutely. And I think that's also the case, frankly, for me, when, uh, in the 2019 election. I mean, I know that there was, you know, the Labor Party's own inquiry that was done that was talking about the kind of the cluttered nature of the agenda and also people being able to see through the fact that, um, you know, you, the Labor Party was saying one thing up in the Hunter and another thing in the inner cities. Now, the coalition can sort of get away with that or has to date, I mean, this is what's interesting, to date it has got away with it because they're saying, oh, that's the nationals being crazy up there and that's not the sensible Liberals who will be governing for you here in the cities, dear inner city dwellers. But, of course, they are now, because of the rise of the independents, they are now kind of caught in the same kind of bind. Um, but, yeah, I mean... I think 2019 was probably, you know, the, I mean, the idea that it was because of franking credits and it was when the Tasmanian seats were the first to fall, which has nothing to do with franking credits, um, I think is also a flawed analysis. And I agree. I think one of, one of my frustrations there was, well, if you're going to talk about franking credits before the election, which you shouldn't have, um, then you should have quite clearly tied it to benefits for that same age group. And you look at the demands we have now on funding aged care. Um, if we'd said, well, with that eventually 10 to 15 billion a year that we're going to be paying out in franking credits, 
by 2025, we invest that in the aged care system, because a lot of the reason people won't draw down on their super is because they're afraid of going into residential aged care, right? So that, I think, goes back to Barry's point about the inability to sell an argument. And as you know, my feelings on the stage three tax cuts were very much the same. Um, yeah. But I... I'll go to more questions because otherwise we won't fit anyone else in. Um, and I think David Allen's question goes to this, which is he, he remembers Kevin Rudd spoke about taking the moral middle ground. Morrison seems to have taken this with his happy, clappy Christianity, David. Um, how can Labor take the moral middle ground with a small target approach? Is that possible? Well, I mean, I, I don't know that there is a kind of a, a moral middle ground, you know, there's sort of there is it's something's either moral or it kind of it isn't. And, and I think that we've gone so like where morality isn't considered in our policy process anymore. Um, and what is the right thing to do? Uh, and, you know, that I don't understand why people would get into kind of public life um, and particularly politics and the very kind of bruising nature of the lifestyle that you have to lead if you're not there to do the right thing. Now, it seems, you know, for the Conservatives, I don't think they are there to do the right things. I think they do, they're do. they there to, you know, basically enrich themselves and, and their ideological allies. And at the moment, that seems to be protecting at all costs the fossil fuel industry, even where it makes no logical sense, no economic sense, no practical sense. Um, and that's what's been interesting about the IPCC report that's just come out, because it, it goes through really forensically the different mitigation strategies that one could adopt um, for the climate crisis and the ones which are cheapest, um, most readily available um, and most effective um, are things like, you know, trees and renewable energy and electrifying everything so that we then use um, renewables to power that electric uh, electricity. And it's not trying to hang on desperately to coal mines and ex ex expand them. So as I say, I think and I'll get, I get distracted on that kind of thing. But so I think that's clearly um, a, a, a reason and the objective of, of some of our conservative friends. But with the Labor Party, it, you know, you really have to be thinking about what is the right thing to do for our country? What is the right thing to do for the majority of the people? Um, how can we best uh, ameliorate the inequalities that exist in our country? How can we look at um, uh, dealing with the, the ongoing fracture still between First Nations people and the rest of us? How can we embrace, what can we do? What measures can we take um, on all of these areas? And yes, you can have debates around the margins and about the strategy to get to places, but when it comes to sort of a morality, um, I think trying to pass those positions and find a sort of a middle ground that doesn't offend anybody. I mean, it's that, you know, that old saying that if you walk right down the centre of the street, then you're going to get run over by the on oncoming traffic. I think you have to kind of map out your territory, um, develop your narrative and then sell it talk about it, engage with it, um, find ways of engaging with the Australian people. And look, one other thing, look, one thing I'll just comment on is I know that a lot of people say, well, yeah, Murdoch Media, what are we going to do? Um, and I absolutely accept that, you know, there are real problems with our media in this country and its concentration, the most concentrated media market of any country in the world. Um, and you know, I would support some kind of Royal Commission into that concentration and looking at different ways that we can um, empower and strengthen other forms of media. Um, but, you know, in my little flirtation at the moment with electoral politics and running a campaign, it's all very well. We, we talk about, and others have talked before, about the air war and the ground war. And the air war is the kind of the media. Um, it is you know, you being out there and being seen on in the front page of the advertiser or on RN or whatever it is that you can do. But the ground war is where you're actually engaging directly with voters and it is the door knocking and it's the supermarkets and it's the visits in private homes and all these sorts of things. And it's when people run really effective ground wars um, that they seem to do best. Um, and we've seen that through the independence campaigns, those that have been sort of out there on the ground for a long time. But here in South Australia, um, where, you know, the recent election result, the scale of it was a surprise. I don't think anybody thought that um, 
by the time the election came around, I think most people thought that uh, it was going to be a one term government, which in itself is sort of unusual, uh, given that um, it had been, it, would, it got us through COVID relatively well. Um, why it was going to be turfed out, some people couldn't quite grapple with, but nonetheless, there was that expectation, but the scale of it was still a surprise. And I think, you know, part of that was because Labor started the election campaign in its way the day after they lost government. Um, and when Pina Manalauskas was um, a leader, like my mum lives in one of the suburbs here in Adelaide, like three years ago, she got a little thing in her letterbox saying, come and meet Peter and talk to him about your concerns. They pre-selected their candidates for all of those marginal seats two years ago, and each of those candidates had drawn up the entire electorate twice. So people felt they knew them and they knew who they were and what they stood for. So there are ways that you can combat the kind of the ideological opposition and the propaganda arms that are being run by, you know, the Murdoch media at the moment to, to get that message out and to persuade people. Yeah, and I think, I think I see evidence of that happening in the Federal Labor Party too. I think those of us engaged in the big picture have been frustrated perhaps at a lack of cut through, but um, actually Albanese said something very similar to me shortly after the 2019 election that you just said, which is that you frame your narrative, you understand what you want to sell and then you get about selling it directly to people. And I think yeah. if you look at the ground game in Queensland and New South Wales in particular, that's what they've been trying to do. As somebody who, who was the advisor that tried to help Labor reform the media concentration in this, in this country last time around, um, it will be a brave attempt to do it again, but we can't give up on that. I'm going to combine two questions into one because otherwise we won't get, uh, get them read we've only got a few minutes to go um so ian firstly says do you think we would be better off if we had no political parties and all members of parliament were independents whereas simon uh, notes that you're something of an outlier amongst the independents coming from the left as we talked about um if you get elected what do you think that might mean for the way the independents are able to behave as a block on occasion well, look, I think, um, I don't know that I think we have to get rid of political parties uh, altogether. And, and Margaret Simons talks about this in a very fine essay, actually, in this month's The Monthly, which I recommend everyone reads. Um, you know, the, the basis for political parties were people kind of coming together because they did have a shared ideology and a shared vision. Um, and I think that can be an efficient way of doing things. But I don't think it has to be the only way of doing things. Um, and I think that's the key point. Um, and particularly when we do seem to have a kind of an ossification within the parties, certainly within the Conservative parties, you know, this refusal to engage with the kind of Australia that we are and continuing to be this sort of white male party um, and, you know, kind of digging in, um, like in New South Wales, here in South Australia as well, there's these sort of Pentecostal stacking pushes going on. So they're not improving at the moment. Um, so they do need to get is, you know, a shock. I think they need to be woken up. And I think that's part of what this process can be. Um, you know, having coalition governments is just so normal all around the rest of the world. And indeed, we have a coalition government right now. We just don't seem to think about it in the same way as all the danger of having a Labor-Greens alliance. Why is that different, actually, to have a centre-left alliance than a centre-right? Like, I, I don't understand that. And so I don't think it is as much of a risk um, to have a, a crossbench, I mean, it works in the Senate, you know, it, but it just means that different perspectives have to be brought to bear and they have to be negotiated um, before you can just adopt a sort of a, a bland, broad policy position. Um, I think if there is an independent crossbench, and I hope there is, um, and it isn't outside the bounds of possibility, um, what is uh, interesting, um, I think when I say when I first got involved as well and decided to run, there was a fear that it might be, as I say, more of a seat by seat um, arm wrestle to try and wrest each seat from the government. And that was part of my motivation of, of getting involved. Um, if the swing is on as the way the polls are suggesting that it is, I suspect it could be a majority Labor government. And so the crossbench issues um, won't be as important when it comes to determining government, clearly. Um, but I do think that what the last parliament has shown and the one just before it, particularly when Karen Phelps was also uh, on the crossbench, is the impact that independents can have even without holding the balance of power, the way that they can influence the debate, the way that they can foreground issues. Um, you know, it was Rebecca Sharkey 
these amendments that were introduced on the religious discrimination bill that really determined the outcome of that bill and, and derailed it, um, thank God, so that it, it didn't um, make it to the Senate in the end. So there's different ways that independents can influence what's going on in Parliament. Um, we have already influenced the campaign. Um, but if we were to hold the balance of power, look, I don't think there's a necessity for us to uh, negotiate on a block on everything. Um, I think there are clear, clear issues on which we will all agree um, around climate and integrity, um, what we can do on women's issues, for example. Um, but I suspect there are quite a few issues on which we won't necessarily be unanimous. And, you know, Allegra Spender's position on tax policy, I'm sure it's very, very different from mine. I think I might be dealing with Andrew Wilkie on those issues and perhaps even Adam Bant, whereas she might be dealing more with Zoe Daniel and, um, uh, and, and, and possibly Rebecca here too. But I think there'll be lots of things where we'll find common ground, um, but there'll be a dynamism and, and genuine debate going on in the House, which I think would be very exciting. Yeah, look, I, I having been a, an advisor and a Senate tactics advisor in the Gillard government where that was a hung parliament in both houses, um, but yet passed more legislation than any other parliament in our history. Um, and there was a lot of negotiation done behind the scenes um, that I was involved in. And in almost every case, it strengthened the legislative yep. outcome to have those voices. I, I share your view. I think we're more likely to see the balance of power issues playing out in the Senate after the election. But as you say, um, that incident with Rebecca Sharkey's movements to the religious discrimination bill, right? Labor would have moved those movements, but Liberal members would not have crossed the floor for yep. a Labor bill. So it's yep. how those can work strategically in the parliament to make Absolutely. the change. Yeah. It's a parliament's not, uh, it still is the representative of the people. So Absolutely. Joe, so we're going over time, which uh, oh, always happens goodness. with someone I, I enjoy talking to. Um, but thank you for joining us and best of luck in your campaign in Boothby. Um, we'll follow it with interest here at Per Capita and hope to have you thank back you. again after the election. Perhaps. Oh, I'd love to be back anytime. Meeting of thank the minds you. here. <laughs> Joe, Joe invited me to the Adelaide Writers Festival last year, which was what probably the highlight of my year. So thank you very much. Oh, it was lovely to have you. It was great to meet you in person. Lovely. on a very strange day but yes it was lovely to meet you too. <laughs> um everybody we will be back uh the election we expect to be called any day now so keep an eye on per capita's newsletters and websites for upcoming conversations we'll be having through the campaign uh you may want to check out our most recent report which came out yesterday which is a blueprint for better cleaner jobs industrial strategies for the post-carbon economy by my colleagues Shirley Jackson and Sam Ibrahim. It's a great piece of work. Um, and we'll be doing a lot more work around the care space too, having seen that be a focus of uh, the opposition leader's budget reply, which I was particularly chuffed about. So thank you again, Joe. Thank you all no for joining. And um, we hope to see you sometime, all of you during the election campaign. <laughs>